Welcome to worship. My name is Amy Castillo. I'm the family and missions pastor, and we are delighted you've chosen to worship with us today. If you are joining us for the first time online or have been worshiping with us for the past six weeks, we want you to know that you are welcome. Please know that if you have any prayer needs, you can go to the following link and our pastoral staff would be honored to pray with you. Also, as in the coming weeks, we find out more information about when we'll be back in our building and how we're going to phase into worshiping together, please check out our website for more information. Let's worship together. Hi, it's Anna, and I'm going to be sharing my glorious day that I've recently had, but I'll take it back to the summer before I started senior year where I applied and committed to do the World Race Gap Year. Uh, this is a nine month mission trip and it'll take me to Romania, South Asia, and Costa Rica and I'll stay in each of those countries for three months at a time. Now when I committed to this I knew that it was going to be a lot of money, several thousands of dollars, um, but I didn't really have doubt, I didn't have any hesitation, I knew that that's right where the Lord wanted me. I was fully confident in this calling and I knew He was going to provide. So then, fast forward about five or six months into my commitment, I have several donors. I have several people praying for me, following my blog, and everything was great, but I still had doubt creep in and there was a lot of hesitation. And I was feeling unworthy of going on this trip. I was feeling unqualified. Just all the things, all the lies of the enemy, you know, the worst. So then the opportunity came up for a donation. I still had about 50% of my funds that needed to be raised, and this donation was going to cover about 15 or 20% of that. So I gave in the information, I did all the things needed to get this donation, and about a month and a half later, I get a phone call and basically they call to tell me that they are able to give me more than 50%, like more than five zero, more than what I needed, which was amazing. I, I, I was fully funded, or I am fully funded, everything has been covered, everything is provided and that was such a glorious day. I felt the Lord just say, you know what, I've got you covered completely, this is exactly where I want you, there's no reason for doubt or hesitation, and it was the most affirming moment in knowing that the Lord is guiding and He's providing, and He's never going to put me in a place or position that He knows I can't handle, um, and just knowing that He covered me completely and provided all of those funds for me was just glorious. So, yeah. <laughs> Come on. This is my story. This is your story. Let's sing it out. I needed
Good morning. Man, I am so glad that you have joined us today and uh, pray you receive a blessing. I know you probably have already received a blessing by what you've heard and what you've uh, maybe been singing with. But uh, thank you again for taking time to join together in worship. We're continuing our, our study on the parables. I, I love the parables of Jesus. Remember, a parable is simply just a spiritual story or just a story that has primarily one point. Now, not all parables have one point. Some have more points, but they, they generally have, have one point. And uh, this parable is, is no exception. Uh, to get to this parable, we kind of have to take the journey with Jesus because it sets it up so well. Three weeks, or actually not three weeks, three days after Jesus shares this parable, he's crucified. But let's back up to the events that took place before he shares this parable. Let's begin with his journey into Jerusalem. As he and his disciples are walking toward Jerusalem, he passes a fig tree. When he passes the fig tree, he, he kind of digs around the fig tree looking for a fig to eat. There's not one, and so he curses the fig tree and says, may you never bear fruit again. And the fig tree withers. Then he makes his way into Jerusalem, and when he arrives in Jerusalem, he enters not as a conquering king, but as a humble servant. He rides in on a donkey, a new colt. And so he comes in humbly, yet people were thinking he would come in mightily. And so that's a little bit of a surprise. Then when he gets to the temple, he's in the outer courts of the temple. That's where the trading would take place. And when he sees these uh, uh, money changers, exchanging goods for money and money for goods, Jesus kind of has a breakdown moment and he begins to flip tables over. He picks up a whip and he drives them out of the temple. And he says this, my father's house is to be a house of prayer, but you've made it nothing more than a den of thieves. And he drives them, them out. Well, he, uh, he at that point is confronted by the Pharisees. Of course he is. He's just messed up the money system for them. He's messed up their operation. And uh, they come to Jesus and try to entrap him. And they question him about by what authority did he do these things? Of course they have that question. Well, Jesus doesn't answer their question. Instead, he poses them a question. And the question he asks them is about John, John the Baptist. And he asks them about his baptism. He said, was it from men or was it from heaven? And he put them in a place where they were going to have to choose. And so they decided, they talked amongst themselves and they said, well, you know, if we say it was from heaven, then he's going to, Jesus is going to say, then why didn't you believe? If we say it's from men, then we're going to lose our following and we'll be at risk of losing everything. So they made the, the wise decision. They looked at Jesus and said, oh no. <laughs> and so Jesus looks at them and said, well, if you're not going to answer my question, that I'm not going to answer yours. And then he tells them two parables. The first parable is about two sons. And, and the, the father comes to the son and says, look, I want you to go out and I want you to work in the, in the field. And he says, sure, I'll go, but he doesn't go. The next son he comes to, he says, look, I want you to go work in the field. He says, no, I'm not going to go work in the field. But then he goes and he works in the field and obeys his father. Jesus looks at the Pharisees and says, which one did right? They said, well, the one that went in the field. He says, that's right, he went to gather the harvest. And then he tells the parable that we're gonna look at today. This is a fascinating parable. Instead of me taking time to read it to you, I, I want just to kind of talk it through and then let's read what uh, Jesus said to kind of bring it to closure, okay? This parable again is, is about a wealthy landowner and he decides to plant a vineyard. But because the vineyard is large enough, he does more than just plant the vineyard. He plants the vineyard and then he builds a wall around it. And it's not just any wall. This is a, this is a rock wall. It, it takes some time, it takes a lot of effort, it takes a lot of material. He builds a rock wall, why? It, it brings protection to the, to the vineyard. It brings protection from thieves. It, it brings protection from uh, wild animals. So he, he builds the, uh, the wall. He also builds a wine press so that it can be a producing vineyard. And he builds a tower. Now this isn't just a lookout tower. Uh, in fact, scholarship tells us that these towers were so large, fam the family that owned the vineyard would live in the tower. So it was a very large tower, and it was for lookout, it was for protection, 
but Fender would also live there. Well, this wealthy landowner clearly owned more than just this land because he leaves. But before he leaves, he hires some tenants, some farmers, they're called tenants at this time, to, uh, to come and work the land. And in doing so, the expectation was that when harvest time came, the owner would come, he would receive his portion of the crops and uh, money for that or the crops to be sold. And then these tenants would get their portion for working the land. And so harvest time has come. And the, the wealthy landowner sends uh, his servants to come collect what is duly his. But the tenants, they seize these servants and Matthew tells us that one of them they, they, uh, they beat up, the second one they killed, and the third one they stoned. Well, the master didn't receive what he was due, so what does he do? He sent even more servants, and Matthew tells us they did the exact same thing with those servants. They beat one up, they killed one, and they stoned one. And however many times he continued to send servants, that's what happened. Well, this landowner now decides to take a different strategy. Jesus said that he sent his one son, thinking, well, these tenants, they won't mess with my son. They respect me. They're going to respect my son. And you probably already know that's not what happened. What happened was they seized the son, they took him outside of the vineyard, and they killed him. And they killed him. At this point, Jesus turns to the Pharisees and, and asks the question, so tell me, what do you think that landowner should do? Well, the Pharisees are all worked up. They're kind of frothing at the mouth, and, and they said, man, they, he ought to kill those, those tenants and uh, hire new ones that are more faithful, that are more honest, and he should do that. Jesus looks at them, and now he makes the point. And in verse 42, this, this parable began in verse 33 of Matthew 21. In verse 42, Jesus looks at them, and, and he says this. Have you never read the scriptures? Let's just stop there. That's just insulting. <laughs> I mean, it is absolutely insulting. It'd be like going to a seminary class of a bunch of preachers and, or, or go to a convention where pastors are gathered together and to say, have you guys ever read your Bible? Because that's what Jesus is asking. Of course they have. Not only had, had they read their Bible, but what he's going to share is a very familiar uh, verse from Psalms 118. He says this, have you ever read your scriptures, read the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. Jesus has, has looked at them and said, okay, look, uh, this thing that you've said, Psalm 118, which is called the halal, uh, was something that was quoted at every feast. Well, they were in the middle of the feast. It was the Passover feast. And they had been quoting this, so Jesus quotes it to them. They, they know it very well, and they been, had been reciting it. But Jesus flips it on its head, and this is how he does. He says, look, you rejected the stone. Uh, the builders rejected this stone, meaning it's the stone of the temple. It's the cornerstone. Now, the cornerstone is significant because it's the stone that ties all the other stones together. That, that stone is, is laid there, and every other stone is connected to that stone. It is, it is the premier stone. The cornerstone. But Jesus said, uh, you have not just rejected the cornerstone there in the temple, you've rejected me. And I am the cornerstone. God has made me the cornerstone. It's interesting in the Hebrew language, the word for son is ben, and the word for stone is eben. There's a one letter difference, and the Jews love play on words at this time. And so when Jesus said, you rejected the stone, uh, he said eben, but it could have been taken, you rejected the son, Ben. Well, either way, they were rejecting Jesus. And he knew that. Kn knew that. Well, we go on to verse 43. He said, I tell you the truth, that the kingdom of heaven will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce fruit. What harsh words are those? And Jesus looked at them and said, uh, I'm really concerned about fruit bearing. And you haven't been bearing fruit. In fact, you have stood against, against me. You've rejected me. A lot of scholarship says this verse 
is the most important verse in all of Matthew. Because he says, I tell you the truth, the kingdom of heaven is going to be taken away from you. It's going to be taken away from you. It's going to be given to someone else. It's going to be taken away from you because you're not bearing fruit. It's going to be given to someone else who will bear fruit. And we know that happened. The Jewish people rejected Jesus and now uh, Jesus has embraced the Gentiles. God has embraced the Gentiles and the faithful Jews and it's a new people. It's, it's a new opportunity to share the goodness. And then we come to verse 44. He says, anyone who falls on this stone will be broken and anyone whom this stone falls on will be crushed. To reject Jesus Christ means there, there's a breaking there. But one day Jesus is going to return and he's not coming as suffering servant when he returns. He's coming as king of kings and to reject him then is to be crushed. And so e either way, you lose when you reject Jesus. Well, this, parallel, the, the, this parable between Jesus and the Pharisees ends with the dialogue and the, and the parable ends by saying uh, this final conversation was the breaking point for the Pharisees. They determined at that point Jesus was going to die and they were going to kill him. And it would be, it would be three days later that Jesus was crucified outside the walls of Jerusalem. The Pharisees acted exactly as the tenants in the parable. They rejected Jesus they rejected the only Son of God, and they put him to death. What does that say to us? How does this parable apply to you and to me? Well, understand this. God's, I, I think there, there's two things we say. One is God's purpose. God's purpose. I hope you understand. God loves you, and he pursues you. And just like this story, this landowner sent servant after servant after servant to come claim what was his. God pursues you and he, and he will send person after person to draw you to himself. He's done it throughout history. In the Old Testament, you have all the prophets who came before the people and they, they preached before the people to draw them to Jesus, draw them to God. But yet the people, they beat some, they killed some, and they stoned some. They rejected the prophets. And, and God did that over and over again. You come to the New Testament, and now God sends his only son, and you know they rejected him. They took him outside the city gates, and they put him to death. This parable displays the patience, unrelenting, unrelenting pursuit of God for you. He loves you. He wants you in a relationship with him, and he will never Stop trying to reach you. That's his purpose. But the second part of this is the people. The people. You see, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, were consumed with their methods, and they missed the message. Understand this, the, the methods will always change, but the message will always be the same. People need a relationship with Jesus Christ. We do not have hope without Jesus Christ. And people need to come into that, that relationship. The methods to introduce them to Jesus Christ will always change, but the message is always the same. God loves you and wants a relationship with you. More than that, when you come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, His number one desire is for you to bear fruit. For you, for you to bear fruit. That's why last week I loved the testimony of Mike Haynes. Mike Haynes has shared his faith, and someone uh, that he knows has now come to faith in Jesus Christ. That is a powerful message. That's what God desires, but there, there's more than that. Yeah, that, that's one type of, brute, of, of uh, fruit bearing, but God desires even more than that. Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23 says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's, it's all of that. And so fruit bearing in your life is, is an attitude that is a loving, gentle, kind, patient, uh, faithful, self-controlled attitude. Sounds a little bit like Jesus to me. And to have that kind of attitude is attractive. And guess what that kind of that attitude does? It draws people to God. It draws people to Jesus. It's just the way that God uses you to bring people to him. Why? 
because he wants you to bear fruit. The warning of this parable is, if you refuse that, if you reject that, you're basically stubbing your toe against the cornerstone, Jesus Christ. And if you continue to reject it, he's going to come back and you fall under his judgment and you'll be crushed. But as a Christ follower, he expects me, he expects you to bear fruit, fruit in our lives, but to introduce people to Jesus Christ. We're not responsible for their reaction, but we're responsible for the sharing. And the warning is this, if we don't, God will find the people who will. As a church, Meadowbrook, if we don't share the good news of Jesus Christ, that God will raise up a church that will. My prayer is that we will be the church who are desperate to see people come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's our whole mission statement, to introduce people to Jesus Christ and help them grow to become fully committed followers. That is a fruit-bearing church. I pray you will join me. I pray we will join together in leading people to Christ. We do it with our lives and we do it with our words. I pray we bear some fruit this week. Will you join me? Let's pray together. Our God and our great Father, we thank you for the, these great words of Jesus. God, they are challenging to us. But God, we know how much you love us and how, how you walk with us. And God, I pray we would walk with you that we would love you with all of our heart and mind, soul and strength and we would love our neighbors like we love ourselves. And God, even in this time of, of being, uh, of, of, iso of feeling maybe isolated, but God, with things starting to kind of reopen, God, we, we know that we have opportunities to, to see people face to face and we can share good news of God's love. God, thank you for your love. Thank you for the challenge, but thank you for the, the empowerment you give to us in, in your spirit and you walk with us daily. God, I pray you encourage everyone listening to this, this broadcast, God, that they would know you love them and you desire to be in relationship with them. For it's in Christ's great name we pray. Good morning. Thank you for taking the time to join us in worship this morning. We pray that that parable has blessed you today um, and that you joining us in singing was a great blessing as well. My name is Ty and I am the student pastor here at Meadowbrook. And I want to remind you that we want to hear your glorious day story. We want to know what has God been doing in your life? What incredible thing have you seen him do? Maybe in your life, your family's life, or a neighbor's life. We want to hear those stories and we want to share them with our community. So, Film those. You can go to meadowbrookbc.org. There will be a purple box that says Glorious Day. Click on that and that will give you further instructions and you can upload your Glorious Day story there. We'd love to share that with our people and encourage them in this season. Again, we're so glad that you joined us for worship this morning. We hope you have a blessed day and a blessed week. You are always up to something good.